Hi, welcome to an introduction to angle of arrival estimation. The scenario we'd like to consider is the one shown in the figure on the left side of the screen, in which we have an array, and this array produces outputs, identified as S1 of T, S2 of T, up to Sn of T, so capital N elements in this array. An incident upon this array is a uniform plane wave. That plane wave is instant from a direction identified as r hat naught. r hat being a unit vector, and that unit vector points in the direction of arrival. In other words, the angle of arrival. So just to remind you, a general expression for r hat sub naught, given the angles theta naught and phi naught, is this one here, which you can find in any introductory textbook covering vectors. So the question we would like to answer here is, Given the element outputs, that is, for example, the voltages, what is the direction of arrival? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. My first comment here is not to overthink this problem. I find many people who confront this problem initially immediately jump to a sophisticated algorithm, which they may or may not understand. And usually the better thing to do is to think about the problem in the most basic and simple sense. So let me demonstrate what that is. The simplest thing to do, I would argue, is simply to observe the power that's output from a set of beams and then decide based on whichever beam is producing the maximum power. In other words, form a bunch of beams, measure the power output from those beams, and presumably the beam which produces the greatest power corresponds to the direction of arrival of that instant plane wave. So let's see what that method would look like. The architecture is shown in the figure on the left where the inputs are the time domain outputs of the array elements. And terminology that gets used here is to identify that set of outputs at any given time as a snapshot. So a snapshot is the set of voltages or currents from the array elements at a given time. So what you could do is form a set of beams covering the span of possible angles of arrival. So you could choose M beams, form those beams in candidate directions, and then here are the outputs. Y1 could be a beam pointing in this direction. Y2 could be pointing in a slightly different direction. Up to Y sub M, the mth beam, pointing in uh, this direction. Presumably using M beams, you could cover the space of possible angles of arrival. Then you can see that the number of beams you select is going to have something to do with the resolution with which you can identify the angle of arrival. That will actually be a topic for a different lecture. But clearly, if we have a lot of elements, we can have a lot of beams tessellating the possible span of angles of arrival, and then the resolution will be better. Moving on, we can interpret these beam outputs as tests of the candidate values of direction of arrival. So now we measure the power from each one of those beams. And the way to do that is simply to square the output and integrate over some period of time identified as capital T here. So the maximum cadence with which we can get an independent estimate would be equal to the time T. Now, we're averaging here to get power, but at the same time, we would anticipate an increase in signal-to-noise ratio. Increasing signal-to-noise ratio and selecting T, that's a topic for another lecture. But now we have the power in each one of those beam outputs. So now all that's left to do is simply to choose the maximum power, or you might do something more sophisticated, like interpolating across the results from several beams to identify a result that might fall between two beam pointings. Regardless, the output would then be the direction of arrival. Let me note here that this is a common and an honorable scheme for angle of arrival estimation. Many systems operating in practical applications use precisely this procedure or some variant of it. And the reason is, is because it is simple and robust. However, there are limitations, and we'll get to those at the end of this lecture. The immediate issue is that this description of the procedure is a little bit hard to analyze. In other words, it's hard to know mathematically how this should perform. And furthermore, it obscures some useful insights that we would like to identify here.
So next, let's formulate the same scheme, but using a common mathematical framework. Here we go. Looks like I took the wrong week to quit drinking. The nth element output, the output of element n, we've already identified as s sub n. S sub n is clearly proportional to the waveform as observed at the origin. We'll call that S of t. So S of t is the waveform of the incident signal as it is observed at the origin of the coordinate system. And then obviously we have to account for where the signal is actually received, which is the position of element n, p sub n. So this factor accounts for the fact that we're not observing the signal at the origin, but rather at the position of element n. And then also we have to account for the fact that the element pattern may not be isotropic. In fact, in a practical system, it almost can't be isotropic. So F sub n is the element pattern. This isn't the power pattern, common mistake. The idea is that this is the pattern in voltage or current-like units, not in power units. So now the snapshot we would like to identify with a single quantity, and we'll call that the vector x. The vector x is an n by 1 vector, n rows, one column, where we simply line up those element outputs, that is the snapshot. S of t is in common to all the element outputs in the snapshot, so we can factor that out, leaving this vector, which depends only on the element positions and their patterns. We refer to this as a steering vector. Specifically, it's a steering vector for the direction r hat sub naught. So we'll give that a name. We'll call it the vector a. So the vector a, the steering vector, is an n by 1 vector. So the snapshot can be expressed as the waveform, as measured at the origin, times the steering vector corresponding to the direction of arrival. Now for max gain beam forming in some direction r hat, not r hat naught, but r hat in general, any particular direction, what we would do is we'd multiply each one of the element outputs by the conjugate of the array response. That would make all the phases equal after this multiplication, and then we would have the maximum gain beam. So what we will do is multiply each of the element outputs by the conjugate of the associated element of the steering vector. So, the output of the max gain beam can be written in terms of the snapshot by left to multiplying by the steering vector conjugate transpose. And the conjugate transpose is the Hermitian. So, A super H says take the steering vector, conjugate each element, and then transpose that vector. So, you get a 1 by n vector when right multiplied by the n by 1 snapshot gives you a 1 by 1 vector, which of course is simply the beam output. Okay, now some more notation. If we have a voltage or a current or whatever, some voltage or current-like quantity, we'll call it V, if we want the power in V, then that's going to be proportional to the magnitude of V squared and then average over that quantity. That's the time average. In other words, we'll take V, let's say it's a voltage, multiply by its conjugate, that gives us the magnitude of V squared. We average over that quantity for some interval T, and that gives us a time average power in V. So we'll use a shorthand here. We'll say that's V times V conjugate, and then use the angle brackets to indicate the integration. Using that notation, the power in the output of the beam, y, is y times y conjugate, and then integrate. So that is a Hermitian, steering vector Hermitian, times the snapshot, and then times the same thing, but then taking the Hermitian. So on the left, we have steering vector Hermitian times snapshot. On the right, we can carry the Hermitian operation through, which means you take the Hermitian of each of the operands and reverse the order. So we get snapshot Hermitian right multiplied by steering vector. 
So this is just linear algebra. The, the, the rule is simple. If you have some product and you take the Hermitian, the result is the Hermitian of the second operand times the first operand. And then we observe that the steering vector doesn't vary with time in this operation. Only the snapshot varies with time. So we can factor out the steering vector on the left and the right, leaving only the snapshot times snapshot Hermitian. Now, that's an n by 1 times 1 by n multiplication, which gives you n by n, gives you a matrix. And we call that the spatial covariance matrix. This is R. So when we do this operation, where we multiply the snapshots together to get this matrix, and then integrate over some period t to get this matrix R, R then is a compact description of what the array saw over that interval, over the interval which we integrated. And apparently, it's all we need to know about what the array saw. So we've boiled down everything the array was doing over a period t to an n by n matrix. And this is very convenient. So following through, the power from the beam pointing in the direction r hat can now be given by the spatial covariance matrix, which is left and right multiplied by the steering vector associated with the direction r hat. So now we can describe what we had in the figure shown at the beginning of this lecture as the following mathematical statement. Our best guess at the angle of arrival is given by argmax with respect to any possible angle of arrival of this quantity, spatial covariance matrix, left and right multiplied by the steering vector. So now we've ended up with something which is a little bit abstract and perhaps a little bit arcane sounding and mathematical. So let's interpret what this means. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit amphetamines. So here's an example. In this example, we have one incident signal, and we'll limit the possible angles of arrival to one dimension, namely phi. So now this quantity, r, left and right multiplied by the steering vector, is a function of only phi. And when we plot this thing as a function of phi, we would see something that looks like this curve. And then we would interpret the most likely angle of arrival as being the one for which this quantity is maximized. This is simply a mathematical expression of the architecture that we showed at the beginning of this lecture. Now, this kind of plot is sometimes referred to as a Bartlett spectrum, and this method for determining angle of arrival is sometimes referred to as Bartlett angle of arrival estimation, or Bartlett spectrum angle of arrival estimation, or Bartlett beamforming, there are a number of different names for this, and not all of them include the word Bartlett. But the idea is the same. This is the simplest way to really do this whole operation. So, let's summarize what we have determined here. The procedure goes like this. Before you operate the system that's doing angle of arrival estimation, you have to first get the steering vectors. That is the response of the array to each possible direction of arrival r hat. That is for all values of r hat, all possible directions of arrival. Now, this set of steering vectors is referred to collectively as the array manifold. So the first thing you do before you put it in the field, you would first establish the array manifold, figure out what the steering vectors are for all the possible angles of arrival. Then when you're ready to use the system, the first step would be to collect the data. And the data is the spatial covariance matrix, whose elements are these time average powers determined from multiplying one element by the conjugate of some other element as indicated in this matrix. Now, some more terminology is useful here. The thing that does this, that computes R, the matrix, is sometimes, in some applications, referred to as a correlator, because each one of the elements in this matrix is a correlation. So whatever is doing this is computing n-squared correlations, so we refer to it as a correlator. 
It may or may not be a separate device. It might just be software. Each element of the spatial covariance matrix is a visibility, and it's the visibility for a baseline, where what we mean by baseline is the vector that points to element n from element m. So what the spatial covariance matrix is doing is it's looking at each one of the possible baselines, each one of the possible ways that elements can be separated from each other in the array, and it's computing a correlation. We refer to that correlation as the visibility. We put all the visibilities together, we get a spatial covariance matrix. Third, we compute the Bartlett spectrum. We take the covariance matrix and we left and right multiply by the steering vector. And we do that for every value of the steering vector that corresponds to a plausible angle of arrival. Finally, we find the peak value of that spectrum that we've computed. And we take that to be the estimate of the direction of arrival. That is a mathematical description of the idea expressed in the figure at the beginning of this lecture. I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Now, this certainly isn't the end of angle of arrival estimation theory, if for no other reason that there are many other considerations. Other considerations that you may need to account for include the possibility of having more than one incident signal. Maybe there's two incident signals. Maybe there are many incident signals. Maybe you have more incident signals than the number of elements in the array. This problem of trying to be robust to the number of incident signals in the problem is sometimes referred to as the model order problem. And we've worked out the problem for the lowest possible model order, that is one incident signal. Clearly, there are other considerations if we have more than one incident signal, that is if the model order is higher. We have not considered noise. Noise can come in two different ways. We could have noise internal to the system, and we could have noise external to the system, both of which can have important consequences. A third consideration, maybe the arriving signal is not planar or it's not uniform, in which case we have angle spread. Perhaps the signal is arriving from a range of directions and not just one direction which case this method that we've described is going to end up being biased in, in some way. It's certainly not going to be as useful as it would be for a signal which was arriving entirely from one direction. Fourth, we could have uncertainty in the ray manifold. In other words, maybe our steering vectors are not right. Maybe we simply assumed we have certain steering vectors based on the geometry, but once we put the array in the environment, the element positions are different or the gains are different from what we expected, or there are myriad ways in which the array manifold, the assumed steering vectors, could be different from the actual steering vectors. One way of sorting that out is through calibration. Calibration is an entire topic unto itself. Another way to deal with that problem is by building that uncertainty into the formulation of the angle of arrival problem statement, and perhaps solving for those uncertain quantities. So to be sure, there are other considerations. We're just getting started. But these four, I think, constitute the most common things that need to be considered in practical systems, or that may need to be considered in practical systems. Right, now listen to me. Remember your brakes and switches. Get ready to fire it out. That concludes this lecture on an introduction to angle of arrival estimation.